Good afternoon. I'd like to start by thanking the Academy of Medical Sciences uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk at this meeting. I'm going to present some work that we've done as a collaboration between Ken Smith's lab in the Department of Medicine in Cambridge and Gordon Dugan's lab at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. So, infectious diseases cause major morbidity and mortality in the developing world. Uh, but our understanding of the immune response to infection remains very incomplete. There are, if you like, still many unknown unknowns. And the Sanger Institute has been a driving force uh, of the Knockout Mouse Project. Uh, and this is a project where knockout mouse lines are made for every gene uh, in the mouse genome. And the knockout mice are then subjected to a battery of tests. And so to uncover new pathways uh, in host defense, all of the knockout mice are infected with an attenuated form of the intracellular pathogen Salmonella typhimurium, and that's a non-typhi Salmonella that causes major morbidity uh, worldwide, particularly in the developing world. And their clinical state is then monitored. Now, wild-type mice only develop a very mild illness, and the infection is never fatal. But during the course of these experiments, a strain emerged that had one of the most severe phenotypes <coughs> that we've seen in the uh, pipeline so far, despite screening about 600 lines. These mice had a targeted deletion in BC017643, uh, which excitingly was a completely uncharacterized uh, gene on mouse chromosome 11. And the mice died from the M525 strain uh, of Salmonella, which is still attenuated at about four to five days post-infection, which really indicates a very severe immunodeficiency. And even more surprisingly, they died of ROA, which is actually a, a putative vaccine strain for Salmonella, uh, at about eight days post-infection. And that's been a very reproducible phenotype that's remained stable over time. And we confirmed that they were dying because they were not able to control bacterial replication. So you can see that the Salmonella will normally colonize macrophages in the spleen and the liver. And we see here that there's no heterozygous effect, but if you're a homozygous knockout for BC017643, uh, then you get three or four log-fold higher uh, bacterial counts in the spleen and liver. And also you start to see evidence of colonization in organs that are not normally uh, infected, uh, so much such as the kidney and the colon and cecum. So what is... Uh, BC017643. Well, it's a very highly conserved gene, at least as far back uh, as zebrafish. There is a very highly conserved human uh, ortholog, C17 orf62, uh, which is about 90% similar. Uh, there are no murine paralogs, so there are no other genes in the murine uh, genome that look like this, which probably explains why it's so non redundant in this setting. Uh, interestingly, there is some homology uh, to a, a plant protein called YCF4. Um, which uh, it shares a, a domain of unknown function uh, with BC017643, but neither of these proteins have any recognizable biochemical domains that will give you a good clue to its function. Uh, it encodes 187 uh, amino acid putative transmembrane protein. We've done some work with Alex Bateman at the European Bioinformatics Institute, uh, predicts that it's got two transmembrane uh, uh, passes and then this long cytoplasmic tail that probably interacts with um, uh, with other proteins. I'll come back to the significance of YCF4 uh, in a while, but I should say that I'm a bit of a spoiler coming up because BC017643 is a bit of a mouthful uh, for a whole talk. So um, as we subsequently discovered that this gene is very important in controlling the generation of reactive oxygen species, we renamed it EROS, uh, essential for reactive oxygen species. So consistent with our finding that this is a gene that's involved in the immune system, that is where it is most highly expressed if you look by RNA-seq or proteomics, and this is data from the EBI Expression Atlas, with highest expression in the mouse in spleen and thymus, and, and in human in uh, leukocytes uh, and lymph nodes. And here a darker blue color indicates high expression. So then we asked, well, well, what's the exact nature of the defect in these uh, Eros knockout mice? And, and we know that macrophages are probably the key early cell for controlling uh, replication. We also could see that hematopoiesis was broadly normal. The numbers of monocytes, macrophages, and neutrophils were, were normal in the mice. 
Uh, and we initially did some experiments to see if they can phagocytose bacteria. Can they actually just get the bacteria inside the cell? And they can. Here we're using a GFP-tagged salmonella that expresses GFP under a promoter that the salmonella only switches on when it's in an acidified vacuole. That's called the salmonella-containing vacuole, and it's a type of modified phagosome, which is where salmonella live inside macrophages. Um, so we've got green fluorescent protein here, and we can see that uptake's actually equivalent between the wild type and the knockout mice. And ultra-structurally, there's no problem in for the knockout mice in internalizing uh, the bacteria into a salmonella-containing vacuole, uh, although it is clear that essentially the vacuole is a little bit more ragged and uneven and looks a bit damaged in knockout mice. But they can phagocytose bacteria. But can they kill them? Well, well the short answer to that is no. Uh, and we know that from this gentamicin protection assay. Uh, in this killing assay, uh, macrophages, bone marrow-derived or peritoneal, are allowed to take up uh, live opsonized salmonella. After an hour uh, of phagocytosis, we wash off extracellular bugs with uh, a solution containing gentamicin, and then we allow intracellular killing to proceed. And then at different time points post-infection, we lyse the cells uh, to look at their bacterial content. And you can see really at one and two hours, every time point we've done, there's really a severe deficit uh, in the ability of knockout macrophages to kill salmonella. So we wanted to explore, well, what does this protein do? What's, what's its context within the cell? So we made a, a flag-tagged version of it uh, that expresses uh, an N-terminal flag tag that allows us to localize it in the cell and can be used for, for pull-down experiments as well. And we put that into macrophages using a lentiviral vector. Then we looked ultrastructurally with electron microscopy, and these black dots are anti-flag uh, immunogold dots. We localized the flag with an antibody conjugated to immunogold. What we find is that in uninfected macrophages, the protein largely uh, localizes to the endoplasmic reticulum. But we see something interesting when you take a, a macrophage that's infected with salmonella. You start seeing dots appearing around the salmonella-containing vacuole. So we know that this is a protein that's essential for host defense. We know it can localize to the salmonella-containing vacuole, but what's it doing there? Well, our clue came by looking at pathways that are known to be very important in controlling uh, salmonella. And it's known that the NADPH oxidase system is key. This is a multi-protein complex uh, that generates antibacterial superoxide anions by transferring electrons from NADPH to molecular oxygen, either within the phagosome to try to kill the salmonella in here, or actually for extracellular bacteria at the cell membrane. And the key components I want to highlight are you need this membrane-bound heterodimer GP91 and P22. And you've got three regulatory cytosolic subunits which are needed for full activation, plus the small G protein rack. We know this is very important because there's actually a human disease where people lack components of the uh, reactive oxygen burst machinery, and that causes chronic granulomatous disease in children, which is a very severe immunodeficiency uh, characterized by recurrent infections, including uh, salmonella, uh, as well as staph aureus. Uh, and also, these uh, individuals are prone, interestingly, to autoimmunity, including inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, their mothers, uh, who are often uh, who are heterozygous, particularly in the, in, for the X-linked disease, are mosaic, seem to be also prone to lupus. So there is a, an impact on uh, autoimmune disease. And similarly, um, polymorphic genetic variation uh, in the, uh, the expression of these components has been linked in a number of GWAS studies uh, to the uh, susceptibility uh, to lupus. But we were really struck from the start by the similarity between the phenotype that we saw in our mice, which was dead at five days with high bacterial loads, to that that we saw in mice that lack GP91. This was published by Gordon Dugan and Piero Mastroni several years ago, or P22, and this is new data from the pipeline. And really, these three strains, are, of all of the ones tested, are the only ones that die that quickly. So we asked, well, is there a problem in generating reactive oxygen species in, uh, in our mice? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, we use a uh, luminol chemiluminescent assay here, which is a substrate that reacts and, uh, in the presence of superoxide anions. And we use FMLP, which is a potent bacterial uh, stimulator of the reactive oxygen burst, PMA, a protein kinase C activator, or just live salmonella. And we can see the wild types always get a very nice reactive oxygen burst with a different time course for each, um, uh, for each su substance but the knockouts have a very flat uh, reactive oxygen burst indeed. And so that seemed to be the cellular mechanism 
by which our mice were unable to control salmonella. And so, just to sort of explore that a bit further, we said, well, if they're susceptible to salmonella, they should also be susceptible uh, to other infections that require an intact reactive oxygen burst. And so we infected them with listeria, and we find exactly the same thing. They die early with very high bacterial loads uh, and a septicemia. So we were obviously interested to say, well, why is this? What's the, what's the biochemical and molecular mechanism by which this occurs? And the first thing that we learned was that Eros is not a gene that has any impact on gene expression at all. This is uh, microarray <coughs> profiling of neutrophils from wild-type and knockout mice. And in fact, the only uh, significantly differentially expressed gene uh, is Eros itself, which was reassuring at least. Um, but, and there is no deficit in the expression of the components of the reactive oxygen burst at the message level. We, so we looked individually for P22 and GP91, which were encoded by the genes CYBA and CYBB, but there wasn't any difference, nor with the cytosolic subunits. But it's a totally different story at the protein level. Because in both neutrophils and macrophages, you see an almost total deficit here in neutrophils and here in macrophages of GP91 and P22, which is this key heterodimer that is actually what's generating the reactive oxygen burst. And you can see how bad it is by looking at mice that are actually GP91 deficient, which have none, and, and Eros only has a little bit more. Um, there is normal expression of these cytosolic components, interestingly. It's quite, you might notice that mice that are singly deficient in GP91 also lack P22, and that's important uh, because they're only stable as a heterodimer. So if you lack GP91, uh, then you will lose P22 and vice versa uh, by degradation. So it's possible, in fact, that Eros only affects the uh, level of one of our proteins and the other may be lost as a secondary effect. But, but what's going on? So with this massive loss of GP91 and P22 that meant a loss of the reactive oxygen burst and death from salmonella and listeria, we said, well, are there other proteins that are similarly dysregulated? So we undertook whole cell proteomics, new whole neutrophil proteomics, whole macrophage proteomics uh, to look at which uh, proteins were differentially expressed. And the result was quite startling, which is really that Eros deficiency causes a very specific loss of proteins. You can see over here in neutrophils, these are cells that are downregulated here. Proteins that are downregulating Eros, GP91, P22, Eros itself. Same up here for macrophages, GP91 and P22. And in fact, if you say, well, what proteins are downregulated in knockouts in both uh, neutrophils and macrophages, it is really GP91, P22, and Eros itself, which of course we've knocked out. So, well, what underlies that extremely specific loss of GP91 and P22? And we know it's not message, so we thought, well, it could be reduced translation or it could be accelerated degradation with then degradation by the proteasome or endoplasmic reticulum-associated degradation. And in fact, it is known that this is predominantly, in other settings, how GP91 and P22 abundance is controlled. It also seemed very unlikely that this would be a translational effect on one heterodimeric protein only. So we were working from the idea that this, would be, this was a, an effect on degradation. Useful in this was just coming back to YCF4, a little bit more reading about what YCF4 does. This is the tobacco plant, which is one of many plants you find, but the one, it in, the one in which it has been studied is actually a membrane chaperone for the photosystem 1 uh, photosynthetic complex. So if you knock YCF4 out of plants, they become etiolated and they can't perform photosynthesis properly. And that's because they lose protein expression, but not message expression, of photosystem 1, and photosystem 1, lo and behold, is an NADPH oxyoreductase. So it seemed to us that, in fact, Eros's very distant cousin, uh, the plant protein YCF4, is actually performing a similar function. So from our work, two conjectures arise. You'd say, well, if it's a chaperone, it should physically interact with one of the components, one of the GP91P22 heterodimer, and we uh, transduced uh, our raw macrophages with the Eros flag construct. We performed immunoprecipitation of flag, and we western blotted for GP91. And that's exactly what we find. We get physical association with GP91, not so much with, with P22 at all. So it physically interacts with GP91, which would and it co-localizes with it in the endoplasmic reticulum, and that would fit with a, a role as a chaperone. 
Similarly, we said, well, if it's proteasomal degradation, then you should have an effect whereby if you inhibit endoplasmic reticulum-associated degradation, you should start to restore some of the subunits. And in fact, for P22, uh, that is what we see, although interestingly, not for GP91. So you can't restore GP91 with proteasome inhibitors. So our working model currently is that to stabilize the heterodimer, GP91 binds eros, and in the absence of that, GP91 is lost, either misfolded, incorrectly targeted, or degraded, that's what we're working on at the moment, and then P22 is degraded. So in summary, I've shown you that BCO17643 includes eros, a novel, a highly conserved protein essential for host defense to salmonella and listeria, common, uh, common pathogens. It's a, that's because it's essential for the reactive oxygen burst, and that's because it's essential for protein expression of the GP91 heterodimer. So it's a new component of the oxidative burst machinery. Just two thoughts to leave you with for future directions of this work. It's extremely highly conserved in evolution. Does it only mediate the reactive oxygen burst? Almost certainly not. Um, this is an effect on CD4 T cells of Eros deficiency that is entirely separate from GP91 deficiency, which is a massive overproduction of the cytokine IL-4. And finally, the last thing we're working on is that these mice are rather resistant to tumor metastasis. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank my... <laughs>